Hello and welcome to the New York Empire Podcast presented by Greatest Ultimate Bag. I'm Dan Hilton. He's Matt Pippen Aletta. And with week six came two games to talk about for the New York Empire. But as we'll get into, the weather put a huge asterisk on both of them. But before we get to the games at all, how's it going, Matt? Pretty good. Uh, no complaints over here. The weather was certainly nicer at home than it was on the road for Empire. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's good weather now. Feels nice, but also it's Tuesday and not Friday and Saturday. And hopefully this Saturday against the Atlanta Hustle, let's already not preview that, but we'll just give a little uh, a little call to action at 7 p.m. Pacina Field against the Atlanta Hustle. That is the game of the week as well. So you can watch that on FS2 the morning after. It's on ADL.TV live. But yeah, come to the game and enjoy the what is going to be a very, um, very I would say, hotly contested affair between two of the top five, arguably five teams in the entire league. But before we, again, break down, do a little preview at the end of that game, let's dive into the two games that the Empire just came off of in Week 6. That is an 8-5 win in two quarters or one half against the Boston Glory and the 16-10 win against the Montreal Royale. I guess we just need to start with the Glory game, which... To be cut just in half, if you don't know why, it's because it was a multi-hour lightning delay. And once that ended, there was only field space until 11 p.m., which meant that they had to get in one half to count it as a full game by 11 p.m. Again, that is just the, the, the beauty of field space and, and, and Pearl Ultimate Frisbee and those little nuanced things that you, know, you don't get to see when, when you just read a box score and everything like that. But I feel like when the final whistle blew, it was like 10.59 or something like that. And I guess as a former player, I'll ask you straight up, what are the challenges of a three, four hour? Well, I don't know if it was four hours, but what was a almost a three hour layover before they actually started just having to sit and wait out the lightning like that? Yeah, this happened to us in D.C. years back. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we started and then it immediately got, you know, lightning delayed. We went back in the locker rooms for, I think, hours and, you know when you're in the locker room or the hallways or the facilities with nothing to do, everyone finds something to do. We played a game where we tried to bounce a lacrosse ball into a foam roller off multiple walls. Uh, That took us about 40 minutes. Everybody was participating. And when it finally went in, I'll tell you what, we went nuts. (laughs) It was uh, when when you score a buzzer beater and win a game, it was a similar feel in that hallway. That's how bored we were and how much fun we were. Do you remember who scored it? That's the important thing. I actually do. I'm pretty sure it was. No, wait, no, no. I'm not sure. It might have been Lionel. Um, yeah. So I'll just take credit for it since I actually can't remember. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. It was me. All Crowd right. Well, went on, wild. Well, on no. the <laughs> well on the field for the Glory game, it was not a full strength empire, especially defensively. Brenton Tan was dealing with a little injury all weekend. John Randolph didn't make the trip due to an unforeseen illness. No Antoine Davis. Congratulations to him, by the way, for getting engaged. Some things bigger than ultimate. And then Ben Yacht only played against Boston and then and had jettisoned his way to another engagement. But fortunately, I guess against Boston, it was going to be sloppy regardless who was on the field, whether you're a quote unquote star defensive player or everybody up and down the roster. So, you know, as far as the, the scoring went, it wasn't much of it. Ben Katz had two goals. Jack had two goals. Ben Yacht had two goals. Elliot had one and Oliver had one. And other than the Elliott one, which was thrown by Osgar, I felt like that was the only real goal for the Empire that didn't feel like an absolute slugfest where they just had to kind of punch it in by any means necessary. That was the only one where I felt like there was even a semblance of flow with the offense on the night. Um, Osgar finished with three assists, but the other five assist getters all came from D-line handlers, Aloro, Brownlee, Katz, and Fortin. So this really was just a mess of a game and get that disc over that end line by any means necessary. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that the coaches didn't even really use some of those timeouts early when the D line got the disc. Cause what's the point? You're going to probably get a million shots with the disc. So it was nice to watch the D line get to play a little more, um, get a little chemistry in, even if it's horrible weather, horrible situation. Um, Aloro played pretty great, especially considering the weather and, you know, they they move the disc around okay. It's just it's so hit or miss in weather like that. I texted some of the guys after watching the game and just you know, hey, how bad was it actually? And he said pretty pretty bad. Yeah. Well, I would say the difference to me even on the weekend because we'll talk about Montreal too being super windy. But the difference to me in in games like that is what we've been talking about all season long. Just that that extra level of star power. Just players that are comfortable. And you, that are undeterred by whatever is happening. And to me on the weekend, it seemed like Ryan Osgar was the only player on the field 
who seemed to be untroubled. Like everybody had a little bit of trouble, but he seemed to be the only one almost untroubled all weekend long. He had zero turnovers against Boston with those three assists. And then he was even better on Sunday. He had five assists and just one turn. Like I said, coupled with the zero turns against Boston. And when you have a player like that, who is the, can be the primary help of your offense, who is unaffected, really, I mean, truly looked unaffected by the conditions when everybody else, the minute they have the disc released from their hand, the thing is going crazy. It's, it, it is a testament to just how much technique and skill there is on his throws that he was able to complete them the way he did. He ate up yards the way he did. And to me, I mean, I think in both games all weekend, it seemed like he was the cheat code that said, it doesn't matter how windy or rainy or nasty it is. Ryan Osgar is the difference. Yeah, I think he picked his spots a little better than some other people. Um, sometimes, you know, you get a feel for the gusts and different things. And, you know, part of that is luck, too. I mean, it could be, it you know, could be super gusty. You could be playing, you know, you get five minutes of calm, you go to wind up and throw something and then it just slams in your face. The second you're letting go of it, uh-huh. you're like, wow, that was a terrible throw that I thought I was going to make easily. So, you know, there's, there's also luck combined in there too, but I don't want to, I don't want to downplay. He did play very well still. Yeah. I mean, and you already mentioned one of the other players who played well was Josue Aloro making their uh, debut for the empire or reintroduction for the empire this, this weekend. They took a few first few games off and uh, clearly were ready to go, have been practicing, has been training with the rest of the team. So they had a plus three on Friday and a plus four on Saturday. So for the weekend, just behind Babbitt's plus 11, thanks to his six goal, three block Sunday. And then Osgar's plus eight, as I said, thanks to the five assists that he had against Montreal. So to be the third plus minus getter on the team in that reintroduction in such messy conditions, it is a testament to the fact that while I don't think Josue is the same thing, I mean, they were already on the roster to start the year. So it's not the same thing as picking up John Randolph and Jabron Mieser in week six of last year, but having your D-line be, we'll say, reinvigorated almost midway through the season with a talent like Josue Aloro is a testament to the fact that the Empire, uh, you know, again, reinforcements, it's not like just Carolina got reinforcements or those college kids who came in. No, like the Empire were also prepared to bring in the likes of Josue midseason to, to really help things out. Yeah, and Josue definitely brings an energy and a different sort of pace, which I think will help that D-line offense a little bit moving forward. Um, just quick movements, a lot of, uh, you know, a fake and then a quick inside hit, which a lot of the team is good at doing, but just something a little different about the pace. And then after the throws, Josue tended to push up a little, either stop or cut back and just kind of, not necessarily give and go-ish, but, you know, throw, nice throw, break space, move, get the disc back, do it again. It was uh, uh, almost every other on occasion, and mm. it just it made an impact because they, they weren't super far throws. They weren't super dangerous throws, but they were just quick, well-timed, well-placed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you look well. You look around the league when you talk about D lines, and other than the occasions that we have seen Katz and Randolph kind of run dominator together, and now you incorporate that potentially either Josue might be on the D one or even Josue plays on the D two, then you have an ability with if it's Randolph or Katz being the other one crossing over, if you will. Now you have two different D lines that you're running that can run dominator, right? And so, I mean, how many how many D lines around the league, especially D two lines around the league? Can, can just run Dominator strictly through their handlers and then have whoever it's, it's Ben Yacht roving around, being prepared for that final toss or whoever it may be, uh, creating that space in the end zone. I don't think many D2s around the league can run, as you said, like a quick set Dominator like that. Also, not, uh, not to glance over the fact that Josue also plays very great defense. Um, right. We got like a little sample taste of the Josue Ben Sadok matchup in the Boston game. Obviously, weather's terrible. You're not getting like a real entree there, but I am intrigued to see that matchup on a nice day. Well, yeah, I think the question mark, not not even a question mark, the, the, the coaches know, but how they're again going to rotate the defensive assignments of Josue and Randolph, because now you're looking at those two players that likely will be that is that same matchup, that same shutdown primary handler with. Uh, Brown Lee usually being on the other handler. So whether it's it's Marquez on handler A or the alpha, or whether he's on the, the beta handler or the, the dump reset, and then it's either Randolph or Josue has been on the other one. And because Randolph wasn't there, we're not really sure how those matchups are going to play out. But again, you have the option now of playing 
we'll say you, maybe you play Randolph more on that second D line, or maybe you have the option of playing Josue almost exclusively on that second D line, keep Ethan on that, that D one for, for the reasons why you have him there uh, and go about it that way. And again, those are good problems to have if you're the empire coaches. Um, so now moving over to Montreal a little bit here, there was something about Kevin Quinlan who to his credit has played in every AUDL season, one more than even Kat and Mike Dross due to his time with the Rochester Dragons, RIP to them. But there was something about Quinlan playing in a sloppy game against the Empire at that field in Montreal, at that camera angle, especially watching at home, that felt a lot like deja vu to me. It's not really a compliment to the conditions, but it did feel like 2015. It felt like 2015, Royale's first, uh, first year in the league. It felt like the second year of the Empire in 2015. It's what it felt like to me. Um, that's, I don't know. It was a weird feel to the game. And as you and I were saying before we, we hit record, uh, I don't know how much we gleaned from either of these games because Boston, which was supposed to be the big 3-0 against, uh, at the time, 5-0 matchup, but instead it just wound up being, or 4-0 matchup, but instead it just wound up being, you know, rain. And for Montreal, I mean, Montreal, they could have, what I will say is they could have just completely rolled over based on the talent they had available. They were even missing William St. Pierre, their, their young goal scorer, nine goals and a block in just two games. So they didn't have him, but I don't know. It just felt like one of those, you know, they punch a little bit, punch a little bit. But as again, we've been talking all season long, the Empire have superior talent and that is what led them to the win. And when I say win, I also want to say win because the wind didn't help anybody <laughs> the whole game. It was just messy. Yeah. Uh, first, it did feel like deja vu, even just watching it for me. Um, we played in that stadium a bunch of times and there was swirly bad win many times and you know it, it definitely has an effect on the game and it's hard to plan for um and then when it got uh, maybe say a little nicer towards the end there was a shot from the, like the far side and you could see all like those like large clumps of like pollen or whatever are just floating around and that brought me back too i just remember running around getting those things on your face and your mouth it's like oh i i miss it but i also don't miss it <laughs> No, I know. And then I, I, my heart goes out to even like young players. Zachary Burpee, of course, played last year with Boston, finished up his Kalita season with Tufts, uh, made his Empire debut for that one. He is just a big, big body. I think he's like 6'4", 6'5". He is Lithio. He is yacht size. And so without yacht, though, it was a Burpee who just came right in and had that assignment. Because a reminder to last year, while playing for Boston, Burpee got the defensive assignment of yacht. <laughs> so it was it was again, a very, very, very much like a Lauren Randolph. It was very much a plug and play with who was available. And one of the players I do want to talk about is down at TEP at the start of the year, Matthias Ling gets hurt, I believe in the first game, like it was a few points, but he had been practicing, obviously having made the team in the tryout. And the coach is really excited about Matthias Ling. But we hadn't been able to see him yet. He's been nursing, I believe, an ankle injury for most of the preseason and then all the way through the first few weeks of the season. And of course, being a young player too, you have to wait for your opportunity. To this point now, Oscar Kohut has played enough games where he looks a lot more comfortable than he did in, in, in his first game. But to be a young player like that and to make your introduction in the wind, in the nasty, nasty weather. And I felt like Matias, his game kind of epitomized what that game was, where it was if the Empire outworked their opponent, if they, you know, with their legs, if they just outworked them, they'd eventually get enough things happen. If they trusted their experience, it was going to work out. But they also needed a player like Matias to kind of run around there. He had one goal. He had an assist. He had three blocks on the day and two drops, which I think is the perfect rookie debut in the windy condition line, including even the two drops where it was just, it was a lot of chaos, a lot of nonsense. And a young player like that, I think just epitomizes all that to me. Yeah. The, the one drop was uh, like a semi layout, uh, pretty hard ground contact. The blade, the disc was coming in kind of blady in yeah. the wind. And then, yeah, that's certainly not an easy catch. Um, as far as debuting in bad conditions like that, especially for a D-line player, I almost feel like it takes some of the pressure off because you're not expecting to play against an offense playing perfectly. Mm -hmm. And when a disc floats and it's not really going anywhere near where the thrower wanted, either high, low, side to side, whatever, um, it's a lot easier to actually just get a D. I, I think Empire had like 20 blocks, which is a ton. Um so, you know, you kind of just, you get on the stat sheet, you feel like you did something, it kind of eases you into the game a little bit. Obviously, when you're holding the disc, you might be a little nervous because it's windy, whatever. But when you see most other players also then just making mistakes, it, you know, kind of just feels more like a game you're probably used to either at the college level or something else. It's like, not everyone's perfect. I don't need to be perfect. Um, the very first Empire game I ever played was, the weather was beautiful. 
while we were warming up and then a storm rolled in and we had torrential torrential downpour for about 10 minutes uh i pulled to start the game i started on defense the first few games i played and i threw it and i had a hat you know the rain is like driving pouring in and i ran right past it on the ground because i couldn't see it the sideline could see it i couldn't that's how windy and driving the rain was like in your face so i heard somebody yell like you've gone too far so i like you know surveyed the scene saw where the disc was and like we adjusted um the game was nuts for those first 10 minutes i we got a d real quick justin allen uh also playing one of his first games with empire picks it up goes to just unlaunch you know launch one of his flicks he was known for and the disc landed about two feet from him uh so he just you know welcome to the team i yelled welcome to the team even though it was also my first game uh, i just thought it was hilarious so you know i think we got it back again like 15 seconds later it was just sometimes in those conditions it kind of you have to laugh a little and it takes a little bit of the pressure off mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the good news is that Justin Allen did rebound from that. That <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of games with the with the Flyers uh, and had a really good AUDL career. Um, but I mean, as far as Montreal too, I guess the last point on them is I mentioned William Saint Pierre, one of their young rookies, twenty two year old, who does again. If you squint, you can see Quentin Bono in the way that he runs and the way that he receives the disc. Just eats up a lot of space very quickly. Is is very quick and very lanky as well. It's got that perfect like ultimate receiver lanky body that I guess worked back then, but now that everybody's in the gym all the time and bulking up nowadays in 2023, I don't know about that, but it's just a throwback to a, to a lanky or a, a Frisbee receiver, but they were not only missing him, but they still did have um, OJ Samar who had a good game. Quinlan, as we mentioned, who was just ageless and timeless. And then Tremblay Jonkas was there as well. I mean, he played about 15 points, still clearly coming back from that long-term injury, the ACL injury, but you know, it's looking like himself more and more, but yet the rest of the team, Montreal looks really young and inexperienced, but in the same way, you feel like they are two or three pieces or a little bit more star power away from figuring something out. Like clearly there was something there very much like Toronto last year. Like you see the young core is forming, it's making sense, but they obviously like, it's not, it's as much talent as is experience. They need the experience certainly, but they're still like, again, two or three players of actual like star power away from being able to, you know, transcend and, and make those kind of games against the empire a bit closer. Yeah. They, they did score some nice goals. They had some, uh, dangerous throws, uh, you know, just around some players, whatever. They also had an amazing possession where empire pulls Montreal got it. Like, I guess around their goal line, but then they had to go backwards a few times, like backwards and towards the sideline. They were almost in the corner of their own end zone and, you know, as I'm watching, I'm thinking like, oh, this is not good. This is going to be a turn. This is, you know, maybe a Callahan. And they just remained pretty calm in that situation. And I, I don't know the actual number. It felt like 20-something passes, and mm-hmm. all of a sudden they scored. They just, you know, ran the whole length of the field with relatively clean offense and not super far passes. And, you know, it, just, it looked very clean, very poised, which was nice to see considering – the disparity in talent and how the weather was affecting the game in general. That was, it was a great possession. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, one of the last points on the weekend was, uh, I, well, I want to call it the race for 200. We have to, we have to, for the next few weeks. Well, I mean, it could even be said this week, but that would have to be a lot of blocks, but the race for 200, both Mike and Ryan picked up two goals a piece on, on Saturday to edge ever closer. Mike now sits at 195. Ryan now sits at 192. I mean, we've mentioned it is a two horse race to get to 200 blocks all time, be the first in AUDL history to get to that marker. Um, I know it continues to be if Mike can keep up the pace of even the two to one, Mike, Mike will get the record before Ryan. I, I know that it is that competition, but I mean, I think there were questions based on how much availability they would have and again, where they would be in terms of um, playing time, things like that. But not only can we reiterate that they are still making the same impact they have in recent seasons, but they both are still getting blocks at the same rate where you could say 200 is possible for both of them by the end of this season. Yeah. And, you know, there were a lot of blocks in the Montreal game. It was windy, discs floated. People were, you know, maybe accruing some blocks they might not have had otherwise. Um, Ryan, one of Ryan's was still just a really nice, like layout D yeah, through on the to block line, something. Yeah. It's, it's not like they're just racking up like, Oh, that was a horrible throw. Like they're still grinding for these D's. So yeah, I don't know. I, 
if I had to bet, I'd probably just say Mike because he's closer, but you just, you never know. It It's fun looking at the stats after a game and seeing like, okay, Boston, ugly game. They both got one. Okay. Montreal, ugly game. Oh, they both got two. Like what they really are twins. It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And as you mentioned, Ryan is kind of not say earning hits a little more than Mike's, but Ryan is, I mean, he's tracking them down. He's getting them and getting big ones in big positions. And we think back to the championship game in 2021 when he, I mean, he earned the block he did. It was one of the blocks that they said many coaches, uh, the coaches said it was one of the turning points of that game that allowed them to capture, uh, sorry, in 2022, uh, not yeah. 2020, but in 2022. Um, okay, he, so last, last key piece of business here, though, uh, is the Atlanta preview. So looking at the early rosters, it seems like everybody is going to be available for both these teams. And that is, I think, exactly what you want to see. You want to see a full roster. You want to see no caveats, no asterisks about who's available, who's not. Of course, the Empire have a a, a few injuries here and there. Same thing with uh, Atlanta. They've got a few injuries here or there. Maybe not 100%, but it looks like, again, full rosters potentially. And very much, I mean, they did not play Carolina, that being the Empire, but playing against D.C., it's a similar thing. You have nine players that I could argue name wise are all offensive stars. Maybe at least seven of the nine, I would call stars like to that level. It is as deep as nine goes in the entire, the whole league on the O-line, Austin Taylor, Bobby Lay, Christian Olsen, breakout rookie, Liam Haberfield, Max Thorne. Then you got Max Smith, uh, Matt Smith, Misha Freisteider, Dean Ramsey, and MVP candidate, Brett Holzmeier. That is a real, real test for this D-line. For the empire. And I think every time it comes to DC, it comes to um, Atlanta, it'll come to Colorado and Salt Lake. No offense to the empire O-line. We kind of know what they have to do and they know what they have to do, but how good and how transcendent and how uh, dominant the empire D-line or D-lines can be, I think is the mark of, you know, w- uh, the championship caliber level of this team this season in the empire. And, and Atlanta must feel the same thing. Yeah, uh, I, I'm very excited for the game. It, it's definitely going to be interesting to see how the coaches, you know, assuming the weather's nice, hopefully we get ourselves a nice treat, especially after this weekend. Um, be interesting to see how the game is managed. Does Empire let the D-line run a little more? Do they just sub out and put their offense in right away? Do they do they approach this as if it's a championship game type of urgency? Um, you know, who plays when? How do they rotate in that X D one D 1.5. However, they're going to handle everything. Um, just really excited to see how it goes down. And like you said, it, Atlanta is a very good team. I mean, yeah, the empire schedule down the stretch here is really, really tough. I don't think anybody else has uh, a tougher end of the season, with the exception of Montreal in the last game at home, all the other teams that the empire face have winning records. It's Atlanta, it's Boston, it's DC, it's Colorado and it's Salt Lake. And again, I believe that is the best win percentage of any schedule down the stretch here. So the Empire will, if they manage to get to championship weekend, will be. Because then that likely means you had to play DC again. Or unless it was, I mean, if Philly can still rescue their season, that that win against Carolina is huge for the Philadelphia Phoenix. Two and four now. And you they have an argument having taken the Empire to o- the overtime and the way that that uh, DC game was so close. There is an argument for the the Phoenix that they feel like they should be four and two instead of or or, or five and one instead of two and four. Um, I I hope that oh sorry no no uh, yeah I I hope that Philly team makes the playoffs even if they you know get knocked out after round one. I mean they certainly deserve it. That's a that's got to be the best two and four team in league history. I I can't imagine otherwise. I yeah I agree. They just they have too many weapons, um, too many good players. Max Trevillis against Carolina was awesome on the D line. I mean, and very rarely do you have a player who people don't really know much about, or he is really just kind of a face in the crowd. And then all of a sudden has an insanely, um, just an amazing breakout season. A guy who wasn't like a, a former college star, or anything like that, a UMBC product where again, he did not have any recognition whatsoever. Did not know who Max Trefillis was, uh, Trif- uh, Trifilis was. And then all of a sudden he just, you know, again, becomes a defensive star in the league in one year. And those are the cool stories where it kind of, it kind of gives us all hope that it's like, okay, even if you feel like you're one thing or the league and ultimate in general has labeled you as one thing, you could always improve. You can always make that step higher. And Pollard, even to last year, we saw from him where he was, okay, this is what James Pollard is. And all of a sudden he's like, well, you know, even at 27 or whatever he was, 26, 27, 28, 
you can transcend and take that next step forward. It, uh, it's, it's fun when unknowns kind of come out and really make an impact right away. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of John Lithio. I didn't really know who he was. And when I was talking to the team before the first game I called, like right after the pandemic, I'm walking around the field and I'm meeting a few new people saying hi. And Babbitt and some of the other guys are introducing him as Lithigoat. Like, goat. I was like, yeah. Really? They're like, just watch out for this guy. He's, yes, he's the real uh, deal. I mean, the only, I think goat, goat is obviously, you know, having a little fun, but yeah. I mean, the impact he made in that first season and last season, you, you can't deny that they, it was only half a joke. Yeah, I mean, I think the only counter argument to that a little bit was that he was an unknown from the ADL completely and just kind of showed up. And to me, actually, Liam, uh, Liam Haberfield is very much the same way. This is a guy already in his mid-20s. Like, he's already been finished with college. He's already been around the world. I mean, he's not, he's not actually from the U.S. I believe he's Australian. So he just kind of showed up in his mid-20s as this, not say finished product, but already who he is. So I, I guess the, 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 the kind of argument would be that these are guys that was kind of ready from, from day one, as opposed to year three, year four, they really transcended in their like mid to late twenties, you know, as opposed to, we do kind of expect players like Ling and Labar and younger players, even Burpee, we expect them to like take these leaps forward at some point. Um, but I, I think for the empire, just to kind of circle all the way back as we wrap it up here, a Laurel might be the answer to that gone for a year. Now we know he'll played club nationals played at a high level, so they could come back in here and be better than they were. Instead of just being a role player, there might be, because of their lockdown defense and how uh, how impactful they can be on the D-line, they're very much like Jabron, I think, would be the other example, a former Rutgers player as well, that Aloro could have transcended and improved even in the year that they were away and just be, you could argue, they would be another star, a Ben Katz-level star to add to this Empire team. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Uh, Josue, you know, First year or two on the team was very good from the beginning, but just, I think, steadily improved year after year after year. I mean, crucial blocks in uh, 18 in the playoffs. And then, yeah, just I, I, who knows what the ceiling is. It's hard to yeah. say. Well, I think for Josue, certainly the two things to look for now is can they continue to get that completion percentage up? That was back to their MOU days, something that, that plagued them quite a bit, turnover numbers. So if they limit turnovers, and as we mentioned, like their, their on-the-mark defense has improved to a level that is uh, higher than what it once was even. They have become a lockdown defender. I, one of the years at tryouts, I think this was 19. So, you know, towards the end for me, uh, we were like inside during the winter and, you know, I had been feeling pretty good, whatever tryouts going well. And then we do some scrimmaging and Jose was on me and, you know, I thought I'd be fine. I made like three or four moves and it just felt like I was like stuck to a glue trap. And I was like, Oh, we're going to have to up this. I'm going to have to try a little harder to get open here. So, yeah. And that was already after a few years of knowing them and, you know, just there, there's room for improvement. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if they take another step and get even better. I'm glad I'm not the one trying to get open there anymore. Well, indoor is the great, uh, the great equalizer, but I was big field though. Big field. Oh, okay. Big field. Yeah. Yeah. Big field inside. All right. All right. Well, either yeah. way, it's for the Empire, the rest of their season is outside because unlike the confines of Indianapolis, there is no inside in the Northeast. That's just the way it is. So you got to deal with the elements. You got to deal with uh, whatever may come your way. And I do always feel like in the East, it is much more of a mud fight of, a, of a, just a, it really is like in the trenches fighting as opposed to out West. You watch those games that are windy and it's still high scoring because it's just, it's just chaos. Like I, I love watching the West in the wind as opposed to the East. It's, just, it's very different stuff. So we love our defense here on the East coast. That's how we do it. So uh, you got to grind those out. So anyway, I think we ground out a good enough podcast. I hope people enjoyed it. And again, that is on Saturday night, 7 PM. It, yes, it's a game of the week. So actually set your DVR so you can watch the game that you just saw live at Fasina Field when you get home and, uh, and you're able to see it the next morning on FS2. But again, it is Fasina Field, 7 p.m. against the Atlanta Hustle. It is a big one. We hope to see you on the field. So thanks so much for Matt. This is Dan. We'll see you soon.